there are a bunch of mammalian models besides human beings that tell us about the plasticity of the genetic underlying basis for aging. I think uh, Michael Rose was saying there is a genetic toolkit out there and like the you know, Krebs cycle is probably in common among all of these, but the variation in the phenotype that we care about, which is maximum lifespan of a species, is you know, a 200 to 1 ratio. I mean, it's like some European tree shrews live a year at the most, and mice and rats and sheep and dogs and so forth, uh, up to humans, the maximum lifespan uh, of human beings that we've validated is Jean-Louis Calmet a French lady who lived to 122 at the time when she died in 1997. By the way, she was a smoker. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but Methuselah, if you read Genesis, uh, lived to 969. But of course, our group was not around to validate him. We've been doing validations for about only 10 years, and we have a very rigorous process in which we get birth certificates and baptismal certificates, uh, census data, you know, marriage certificates, current photo IDs, and so forth. And some of these documents are in the native language of the country where these persons were born, a lot of times in handwriting. And so we need native speakers representing our organization throughout the world. And we have like 40 people in different countries uh, performing this service. And of course, they communicate with us by email on a regular basis. So I get more than 100 messages a day just about the activities of maintaining Table E, our group of living supercentenarians, on a regular basis. But exciting at the bottom bullet is bowhead whales are an existence proof of the thing that we were talking about, the plasticity of maximum lifespan in a mammal. Of course, they don't live in zoos. Um, probably if you tried to put them in captivity, they would never live that long. And we don't know for sure what the upper limit is, I say greater than 225, because some of the documentation evidence for their long life is harpoons that came from Eskimos um, that can be dated, that got stuck in the whale, and the whale never died because of the harpoon. There, there are a few other racemization tests that you can do um, uh, in the proteins of the eye and so forth to establish age. But there's nothing like tree rings, dendrochronology, in order to establish what the age of a mammal is. Here are the conventional diseases that are written on death certificates. But the people that I study have escaped from all of these things pretty much. Um, although we may not escape from swine flu unless we get the vaccine as soon as it's available. Um, and when they escape, they escape because they inherited good genes. As I study these people for the last 15 years or 20 years, I find that they have almost nothing in common in their lifestyle, whether they had this or that occupation or this or that religion is irrelevant. Um, it, it's contradictory as to, oh, my reason for living so long is because of X, Y, Z, but they have one thing in common that's very important, which is long-lived first-degree relatives. Their parents, their siblings, probably their children will live a long time as well, and as a consequence, we conclude that it's something that's inherited, and it must be in the genome. We need to look for it. I'm not going to go through these slides in the time I have available, but just to summarize, Mortality increases exponentially, and when you plot that, as Ray Kurzweil showed, on a semi-log form as a function of time, uh, it's a straight line, the Gompertz curve, that every good actuary knows in the back of their mind uh, for calculating what your term life insurance premiums should be, given your age, regardless of what your blood pressure might be. And, uh, well, there's some weird things going on here to do with childhood illnesses and, um, you know, the point of minimum mortality in human beings is the time of the onset of puberty. That is consistent with the evolutionary hypothesis. And by the time you reach 20, from 20 to 30, your mortality is essentially flat. 
All of these points out here are sort of loose because the n, the numbers of people in this extreme longevity group is so small. And we're hoping to resolve those um, as we look at it. And uh, there's too much text on this slide to look at everything. But as of November 4th, there were 76 validated living, living supercentenarians in the world, with a lot of them being Americans in the US. But the significant number here is the number of females versus males. And we have to get some PhD theses going on what's happening that women in the audience have this longevity advantage that men don't have. And it could be due to the fact that they have double X chromosomes, but we're not really sure about that. Here is Jeanne Calmet when she was at a younger age, and then 80 years later at 120. Um, and all of these people's phenotypes are terrible. You wouldn't want to necessarily trade places with a typical supercentenarian that I interview today because they're very frail and uh, they're typically in a wheelchair, they're typically um, uh, with a walker or a cane at the best, but they're blind, they're deaf, sometimes they're both deaf and blind, you know, you have to shout in their one good ear. Um, and so we have to really understand what is going on to have a, a better model of how the genome plays out in gene expression for these people to live as long as they do. One of the things our group does is to eliminate imposters. You know, there are a lot of claimants who, for political uh, reasons, want to make the claim that they're the oldest person or their family does on their behalf. And so we do a lot of analysis of these claims, and some of them we can't reject because there's not enough information, and sometimes we can because uh, the women give birth, and we know the age of their youngest child. We know, therefore, their age when they were giving a birth to that child, you know, their delivery time. And if it's in the 60s when IVF did not exist, um, that's probably fraudulent. Okay. Um, Here's some just pictures I'm going to go through very quickly of the people we've studied. Uh, Kamato Hongo, 114, uh, John McMorrin, 112 in Florida. Here, closer to home in Sacramento, was George Francis, who passed away at 112. And he actually voted for Obama, looking at the Sacramento Bee newspaper saying Obama won. So he was very happy about that. But he didn't live for another month or two beyond that time. Here I'm interviewing the oldest current man in the world uh, from Great Falls, Montana. We took a road trip uh, to visit him. And on the way back, we visited uh, Delma Kolar, who was 112. Uh, she was 111 at that time. And I just updated the slide because she had a birthday. She lives in Oregon. And this are uh, her granddaughter and her daughter. We know a lot of stuff, scientifically speaking, and in literature and so forth. This is an image of the library in Dublin. But it's not the right kind of knowledge. We're like the blind men touching different parts of the elephant. Some people specialize in telomeres. Some people specialize in the chemistry of free radicals. Some people specialize um, uh, in DNA mutations. Um, is it the snake that the elephant is like? No, we need a better perspective to figure that out. And medicine has certainly come a long way. Here's an amputation going on below the knee. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but we're not there yet. Um, now some data that we've accumulated recently that says that you know, there has been an increase in the numbers of identified supercentenarians because there was a lot of low-hanging fruit when we started the process, and then it flattened out. Here is another example of it flattening out. I mean, there, it's like there's an invisible barrier to living past 125, or say, plus or minus five years. A fuzzy barrier, because we don't know exactly what that limit is. But given your current genome, here's recent data that I have on my computer that says, as of August, it's pretty flat. The numbers of supercentenarians living is not increasing. OK? There's a grim reaper waiting in the wings, even if you escape from heart disease, cancer, and so on that is out to get you. What is that thing that, that gets us? Um, 
It's called TTR amyloidosis, a disease that probably you haven't heard of very much, but um, is been in pathology books for decades because it's a rare disease, but it's well known, and uh, it's uh, a particular kind of protein that is native in the body. It's a tetramer. There are four different colors here. And when it becomes unstable with age and breaks apart, the individual monomers can unfold and then try to refold and misfold and become very sticky. And when they attach to one another, they form fibers. And these amyloid fibrils attach to your blood vessels, interdigitate in your heart, and you get something called senile cardiac amyloidosis. The material in aggregate is very uh, sticky and rubbery, and it interferes with the contractility of your heart.